Good. All right. So this is um, first time with Eric Rai, <laughs> first time with female author, first time with feminist author. So I'm expecting a lot of responses. Let me uh, put you on uh, gallery view. Let's see some of your responses. So anybody really love the Rigurai? Any tens for a Rigurai? No, okay. <laughs> Nine, eight, seven. Wow, okay. Khan, Tamam, all right. Six, five, oh, Isaacs. <laughs> Where is that, Michelle? Four, three, two, one. Okay, let's start with the... Um, Medium haters, Isaac, Morise, Michelle, would you like to share? Um, I think what she says is interesting, but I'll, some parts are a little bit unclear. Like she's not very direct, but I do, I do agree with how she talks about like exchange. She says how kind of people want things in return relationships. And I do understand like what she's trying to say, but I couldn't like really understand it. She wasn't very direct. Okay, yes, yes, she's difficult. She's poetic. And she's referring to the whole history of philosophy. So if you don't know the history of philosophy, we had a number of authors she refers to, right? Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, Levinas. So if you know those guys, you're okay. But if you don't, then you kind of wade through. So yes, good point, very good. Anyone from that group want to add something? I yeah. Think she's okay. kinda, oh, sorry. <laughs> I think she kind of explained everything because that's the same problem. I felt like her book is not for the normal, and I, I mean, normal person. Like, you need to have a lot of graphs, you need to have a lot of understanding from literature point of view to understand her, even just a chapter. And I started the book from scratch. So I'm like, even though I, like sometimes I'm like, wait, what does she mean? Oh, wait, are we talking about sex or something else? Are we talking about, wait, where are we? Like he made, he made me confuse myself sometimes because I feel like she's talking to someone invisible. She's talking about the invisible, the inside, the eternal. So technically she's like mixing religious belief and, and normal belief and, and the world inside of just one subject, which to me was like, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> good, I don't know. Good. Yes, she she has. Um, I mean, what she's she's not so much using religious language as philosophical language, right? These words such as eternal, infinite, those are mainstream, at least in continental philosophy, right? So, but yeah, yes, I see them seeing the same reaction. Mushan, did you want to add? Yeah, I agree totally. What you guys have said before, like. It was very hard to understand. I would have to read the lines over and over again to understand what she was saying just from like one line. And also a lot of times either like I missed when she defined it or like she would use words, but you wouldn't know what she was talking about and she'd use the same words, but you don't know what it means. So when you read it, it's just more confusing. So it was a, a little bit difficult to understand that. All right, very good. Yes, hopefully we'll try and define some of those words for you today. Okay, uh, lovers, any lovers? Hakimian. <clears throat> oh yeah, I'm not so much of a lover, but um, I had one question that like really bothered me. Um, I didn't understand why she never said the word sex like throughout the whole piece. Like clearly most, if not all of the piece was about sex and I just, and she also said that like sex is like indeterminate and ambiguous, but I argue that that she was trying to make this subject even more ambiguous than like it is and it needs to be by like dancing around the, the topic. Um, yeah. So yeah. So she's being subtle, right? <laughs> but uh, when, when it comes to this notion of indeterminate, she's actually criticizing somebody who said that, right? So we'll talk about that. But yeah, if she is talking about sex. Well done. Uh, you did catch that. And we'll talk about that today, obviously. But she's probably not saying the word because she is being so poetic around it, right? She's trying to keep the mystery <laughs> alive. So maybe that's why, right? That she's not directly talking about it like it's a sex ed course or like it's, you know, biology. <laughs> okay. 
Khan, Khan, you have something else to add. But we're not kids. I mean, as soon as you start reading the <laughs> thing, you can actually see what she's talking about. She's talking about harass. A yes is a yes. Like, we know what she meant, but she's just, like, not saying what she meant. Like... So, so, yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> you have to you make me feel like I'm reading a book from my grandmother, like <laughs> technically <laughs> not saying things because she doesn't want to get me to the point of evil. So that's that's the point I'm I'm catching from it. Um, okay, so let me try to explain that since two of you are complaining about this now already, right? Um, there is a way to speak about sexuality which is very direct and transparent, which is the way we speak about it in this country, right? Um, for her. Talking about it this directly is a way to um, take away the mystery of it, right? So she really thinks that when it comes to sexuality, we're, we're dealing with something mysterious, not something just problematic that we have to figure out, right? There is an element, like when Buber talks about the thou, right? The I-thou relationship, there is something, there is a shroud of mystery around the thou, right? So Irigaray is coming from this tradition, philosophical tradition that there's that we need to speak in a way that protects the mystery of it right um so in this country of course we're used to deciphering everything and saying everything as it is that's because we're a scientific minded community right we're trying to figure out it but the regret comes from uh the the philosophical tradition which maintains that there are things we cannot figure out and we have to tread lightly when we approach them we have to uh, acknowledge that there's a dimension of mystery and that's why she doesn't use explicit language. Does that make sense? Uh, both of you who were struggling with this, <laughs> Maurice said, and I forgot who, uh, Michelle, I think? <laughs> no, uh, Hakimian? <laughs> okay, Hakimian, you were also dealing with this, right? You're good? Okay, Maurice said, how are you feeling? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> All right. um, Khan has I just wish because she's a feminist. Like, if you if you're a feminist, just give me the vibe of telling the things how they are. You oh, know? because she, in a point, not. I know she's being scandalous because at the time that she was writing, women wasn't even accepted as writers. You know, so if she was doing it, I mean, it's because you have some gut. Like, show me that. I don't know. <laughs> okay, you have to remember, she's not an American feminist, right? American feminists have a different tone, right? They're much more direct and they're much more aggressive. She's a French feminist. It's a different attitude, <laughs> right? Um, it's a different approach. And she is not, she is writing at a time where women are already emancipated, right? She's writing pretty late. These are books in the 80s and 90s, right? That she's writing, I think, I have to check, right? But, um, but I mean, she's still alive, right? So, so no, she's not trying to be Victorian, as, as you seem to be <laughs> implying, right? Um, right, although it does seem that way. Oh, she's trying to be Victorian, hiding because, you know, we have to be modest as women, right? No, she's coming from this notion that there is a dimension of sacred that we have to be modest about. It's not about women being modest, it's about protecting the sacredness of that dimension. Does that help a little bit, uh, Marissa? Yes. <laughs> okay. Khan, you had your hand up for a while. I've been trying to get you in here. Khan, where are you? Um, I'm here. Um, so, yeah, there, the book is very confusing itself, but I did like, I did, you know, look into who she is and because I haven't in a long time I haven't seen a female philosopher so it was really refreshing to see this after a long time and it's you know when I read about it apparently she's one of the first to call out all of the male philosophers and their perspectives and that's the reason why I like this I like this because this is the first time one of the first times where a female philosopher is calling out specifically by naming them in her text saying that all right we're gonna go over this and I'm gonna tell you my perspective as a woman Okay, very good. Nicely done, Khan. Yeah. <laughs> well, well read. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right, let's try and get into the text and decipher this together. Um, so yes, most of you were right. We will be talking about sex today. Um, so this is actually 
I mean, we can't have a class on love, right, without approaching the topic eventually. So finally, we're here. I'm very happy to be teaching one class at least on this because of the profound void that we have in our education system when it comes to sex education, right? We don't have that much. What we have is, you know, this, this sex education in eighth grade. I don't know if you had it. I remember mine as being a kind of nightmare class where basically the message was, don't have sex, right? And if you do, all of these diseases will happen to you, including the worst, pregnancy. Okay, that's how I would summarize the sex education that I received. Is it better for you now, uh, 30, 40, year, 40 years later? <laughs> or is it still about the same message? I guess it was, for me, it was good because they, I mean, my teachers from my country, they taught me a lot about that the stuff and then, how to protect myself but they also told me about all of the worst things that can happen if you have it and that kind of stuff exactly so we do have in general a kind of fear-based approach i think um it's a very be careful be very cautious all of this could happen to you right so there's an emphasis on the, also on the medical aspect, um, and not much is taught as far as the emotional aspect of a, of a sexual relationship, right? We are not really taught how to make love. We're taught how to have sex, but we're not taught how to make love. And so here we have, if you want uh, to see it that way, sex education, intermediate or upper, upper level, right? With Eric Wright because she's not going to get into the biology of it like it is taught in general, right? The diseases, the protection, the physical aspect. She's going to go into the emotional aspect, right? So now we're going a little deeper in the topic. Uh, and this is really welcome since we really don't have anything apart from this eighth grade sex education. When you go to college, I don't think there is a class that really goes into depth <laughs> with regards to that topic. So here we are. Now we can actually get a little deeper into the emotional aspects. Okay, so, um, so Khan was right. She's, she's going to be talking about three philosophers and she's basically gonna use them as stepping stones. Um, so let me write down the names of those three philosophers. So you have Sartre. I'm gonna just say it in French because these are all French guys. So Sartre. Then we have Merleau-Ponty. So this is a big one. <laughs> You please spell it right during the test. <laughs> and then Levinas. Okay, these are the three guys. Now, she's going to use them as stepping stones to talk about um, different levels of uh, sex, right? So there is a beginner level, there is an intermediate level, and then there is the right um, upper level. So she's saying basically, she, so what's interesting about Eric Ra, she doesn't come in here with moral judgments. This is bad, this is immoral, and this is moral, right? She comes and says sexuality is natural, but we need to, in a way, uh, we need to, uh, how, how do we put it, um, cultivate it. We can't just do it in a primitive way. There are levels, there are levels of refinement so to say right so so she's not gonna so maybe you can jot this down right she's not making any moral judgments she's not coming from a christian moral perspective where you know for example premarital sex is immoral or masturbation is immoral but she's gonna talk about sexuality in all of its diverse um um uh, manifestations but she's gonna say some of these you know are just beginner level right and you want to move to the next level to intermediate level and then you want to go beyond to advanced level. So she believes in refining the way that we have sex, in cultivating this uh, behavior, not just doing it right in a kind of animalistic way or, or primal way. She, she, she believes as a civilization, we need to also become civilized when it comes to lovemaking, right? So let me say that again, because this is really important, right? Just like we've become civilized in music, language, technology, right, literature, philosophy, science, we're highly refined, we're highly civilized, but when it comes to sexuality, we're still like the, 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 the monkeys. <laughs> so we're not much different, she says, right? So we need to also reach a level of civilization when it comes to the art of lovemaking, right? So, so that's a little bit what she's trying to do in the book is to show us there is um, higher levels of having sex and we need to try to reach those levels and not stay on the primal level 
right? So, in fact, she, in, in, in many uh, ancient treatises, um, she's not the first one to say this, that sex is an art, right? You have several ancient treatises that talk about this, right? That sex is an art that needs to be cultivated. Um, let me ask you this question. Um, make sure you have your screens on when I come. Um, put in gallery view. How many of you had to learn to play an instrument? Uh, how many of you were uh, tortured <laughs> as children had to play an instrument? Okay, me too. So me, I was given the violin. No, actually I chose, I wanted to play the violin. But first four years, first four or five years, especially if you're playing a string instrument, how do you sound? Beautiful, gorgeous, how do you sound? What do you think? <laughs> Absolutely terrible. Okay, very good. Horrible, says Siegel. Okay, very good, right? It takes a while to get to know your instrument, right? As a violinist, it took me a while to know exactly where to place the bow, where to place my fingers, what pressure to apply, and so forth. It takes about, for the violin, about four years to sound like people can hear you and not be like, ah. Right, so, uh, so, so because you have to know your instrument. And so what Irigura is teaching us is that likewise, when you're with a partner, you have to learn your partner if you want to really have high level sex. I mean, you can have, you know, normal, like play a few notes and, and it's okay, right? But if you want to get to high levels of refinement, you have to know your partner, right? So this takes time and this takes exclusivity, right? You need to really... Um, I, I would compare it again to instruments, right? Um, what happens if you decide to play three or four instruments at the same time? How good are you going to get at those instruments? <laughs> Khan is shaking her head, right? At one point, your parents will tell you, choose, right? You need to choose your instruments so you get really good, right? Ziegel is saying mediocre in each. So you'll be pretty good, but you can't get to the highest level if you have five different instruments, right? And so it's likewise, what Irigara is saying is likewise, right? You need at one point to focus and hone in on one partner if you want to really get good, right? Uh, you can't be playing a bunch of instruments and think you're going to get good. Well, you'll be well-rounded, you'll have experience, you'll be a pretty good musician. I mean, it's, it doesn't hurt, right? To, to be okay, right? But at one point, if you want to get to the next level, right, you have to become more exclusive. That's the way you get to know your partner. That's the way you can also uh, grow emotionally, which we'll see is an important component in sexuality, right? The emotional part of it. So, so again, right, she's not saying it's bad to have multiple partners and it's, you have to have one partner, but she's saying if you want to get to the highest level of refinement at one point, you will have to do that right? Or you can stay intermediate, <laughs> right? So, um, so this is really what she's talking about, right? We need to learn to, um, to develop the art of lovemaking um, and, and get and, and reach the same level of refinement in our lovemaking that we have reached in, for example, making the iPhone, <laughs> right? That's such a state of the art, right? Object of technology, which I don't use because I can't stand iPhones, but it looks great, right? Um, and we have reached such high levels everywhere. Why not also begin to cultivate our lovemaking, right? So that's really the goal of this whole um, section. Okay, so let's get into what she has to say. So she's going to be, like Khan said, criticizing these three philosophers that I mentioned. And she's using them again like stepping stones. And so I'm going to... Uh, mention them again. So actually, she's going to talk about, first of all, Sartre, right? And for her, he represents beginner sex. <laughs> Doesn't get very uh, elaborate, right? Then she's going to mention Merleau-Ponty. And for her, this is more an intermediate level. It's a little better, but not yet there. And finally, Levinas, she's going to absolutely adore. For her, this is advanced, right? Levinas really understood. So although she's bashing the first two, the, the third one, she's jumping off of, right? She's really um, using his philosophy as the, uh, as the foundation for her own philosophy. So she agrees with him and will build on what he has to say. Okay, very good. So let's begin with Sartre. So because so convoluted, you're right, the way she's writing, I'm going to summarize and then, you know, what she says, and then we'll look at the quotes. So let's first turn there. Let's go to 18. Okay, page 18. This is where she begins talking about Sartre. Let me first summarize a little bit what she's doing, and then we'll, we'll look at the quotes. So basically, what she's saying about Sartre, which he 
what she's diagnosing, she's observing the way he writes about sex, right? So, uh, and she, she's describing it and then she will criticize it. So for, for Sartre, sex is always an act of possession, right? You always, when you're having sex with someone, you ultimately, your deepest desire, conscious or not, is to possess them, to have them, to hold them, to keep them, to get them <laughs> in your possession, right? So that's the, the, and he says, this is subconscious. We all have it, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we are refined about it or coarse about it, we all deep down sexuality is there. We want to possess that person. That's why we have sex. It's a desire to engulf, <laughs> right? So that's the first thing, right? Um, so in this context, he talks about enchanting the other because nobody wants to be engulfed, right? Everybody knows what I mean by engulfed because this is a great word here. <laughs> let me see. Uh, let me turn on the um, gallery. Everybody knows engulfed? It's like, like taking in. You take in something else. Like over. when back. Yeah, yeah, taking over, submerging, <laughs> right? Like when a bacteria engulfed all the bacteria. Very, very good. Yes, exactly like that. Like the phagocytes. Hi. <laughs> Okay, so he's saying ultimately sex is about engulfing, possessing, assimilating the other. Um, it, it's about possession. It's, it's the, the primitive child, right? Grabbing. <laughs> so it's mine, right? It's this primitive desire to have something that's yours. So for this, of course, Sartre says we have to enchant the other because nobody wants to be engulfed, right? If you tell someone, I want you because I want to possess you, they're going to be like, you know, get away from me, you creep, right? So you have to enchant them. You have to seduce them. You have to act like you love them. You have to give them flowers. But the deep desire is very primitive is to engulf them, <laughs> right? So that's his description. It's not far from the truth. In many ways, um, Sartre is right. This is on the primitive level. Most, if not all of us are functioning like this, right? And that's why Rigori says we need to refine ourselves a little bit, right? But to a certain degree, Sartre is very... Uh, realistic about our true intentions, right? Uh, so of course, Irigaray is going to, to complain about that and say, you're short-sighted, you're only seeing this, you're not seeing everything else we could become, right? And that's her criticism, okay? So, so let's, let's read together what, what he says or what she says about him. On the top of page 18, tell me if you're there. If this is the case, are you there? Put your hand in the screen, okay. All right, so she says this. If this is the case, how do I desire the other and enter into a carnal relationship with him? In being in nothingness, Jean-Paul Sartre maintains that the only way is to enchant him, right? There's the notion of enchanting, seducing, because they don't, nobody wants to be possessed, but you want to possess them, so you have to seduce them, so they come closer. Okay, next paragraph. Thus, I can possess. Are you there, hand in the screen? Okay. Thus, this is Sartre, right? Thus, I can possess the other. And according to Sartre, the fulfillment of desire does not exist without such a possession, right? I am only satisfied if I feel that I have possessed you. If I haven't possessed you, if something escapes, I feel dissatisfied, I, I, I still will continue to try to possess you. That's the ultimate um, goal of the sexual embrace is to hold you, <laughs> possess you. Right, so so I is like, okay, this is a realistic view, but she says it's, it's short-sighted, and she says this here in the last paragraph, the other is and remains, hand in the screen if you're there. Okay, the other is and remains transcendent to me through a body, through intentions and words foreign to me, you who are not and will never be me or mine. Right, so she says we have to... What Sartre is talking about is an impossible dream because the other not only is always going to escape me, right? There's always something I can't possess, but it's, it's good that it's so, right? This should be, we should protect this. We should respect this aspect of the other that escapes me and not constantly try to seduce it or bend it or manipulate it, right? Or possess it. So she's saying Sartre is missing that aspect. He's only seeing the other as something that I need to take possession of. Uh, and she's not seeing the other as someone that I also need to set free. That sexuality can also be a way to set the other free. Let me say that again, right? Sartre sees sexuality as a way to possess the other. She's going to describe in the third part sexuality as a way to set the person free. 
to give them back who they are. And let me write this down because this is important. We don't often think about it like that, right? Sex as setting the person free, as giving them back who they are, as revealing them to themselves. Right? So this is completely opposite, right? This is really a different view that we have here, right? That, that is coming and confronting the typical view of sex as possession, right? Okay, so we have this first one. Um, in Buberian terms, how would you define this relationship? <laughs> See if you remember, remember in the Buber, in Buber, in Buber, uh, very good, Hakiman. I, it, I, 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 thou, we're going to see all three today. So this first one, yes, you're right. This is an I, it relationship, right? So Sartre is I, it, right? I, I'm taking, I want to use the other to a certain degree, right? I want to possess them. I want to use them, I need them to be there, so they're kind of like an it. If I'm only after possessing that person for myself, whether it is to satisfy my needs or give me comfort or give me status or a sense of power, right? These are all the different reasons why we would want to possess the other, right? Now I can look good, now I can have status, now I don't have to look like a, you know, a single jerk, right? Now I have an element of, you know, I look good or I have my needs are fulfilled, right? And to, uh, so, so that's why we'd, we'd want to have the other in our possession, right? So we're saying we're missing, we're missing a whole aspect of it, which is about setting the other free, releasing them, giving them back who they are. We'll talk about this in the third section. Okay, any questions on this first beginner sex section before we get to the intermediate level? Everybody good? <laughs> All right, none of you are at that level, I suppose. <laughs> no struggles there. All right, intermediate. So let me summarize. So intermediate is a little better. This is Merleau-Ponty. Um, now you are in a kind of committed relationship. It's not about possession. You really love the person. You're there. You want it to work, right? You want something. You're looking for some emotional connection, whereas before you didn't give a damn. It was just about... <laughs> feeling safe and feeling secure and feeling powerful. Now you are looking to connect emotionally with that person, right? But what Melo Ponty is going to describe is something that a lot of us will experience or have experienced, right? This is something that happens a lot and a lot of us remain puzzled with this. And this is why it's good to read this book because we can maybe find a way beyond this. So here's the experience Melo Ponty uh, talks about. So he's talking about a couple which clearly loves each other they're you know uh, uh, committed to each other so this is you have a good basis it's not an i it right they're, they're 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 wanting to emotionally connect but what he's noticing is that often when you have sex you end up you finish you had a good time but somehow the connection didn't happen right and this often happens right even if you love the person you love them, you love them, you love them, you have sex with them, and you're like, huh, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I don't feel any connection. Like, uh, the connection was better before, right? And now I feel like, I feel like we had a good time, it was fun, we had, there was pleasure, but somehow I feel still disconnected, if not more disconnected than I was before from this person. And so this is what Melo Ponty is describing. And he's saying, like Sartre, he's a little bit of a fatalist. He says, this is inevitable because we cannot, according to Melo Ponty, we can never really reach the other. We always remain locked up within ourselves. No matter how hard we try, the sensations take over, the pleasure takes over, and we remain alone. So he sees this as normal. And that's where Rigori gets angry at him. <laughs> she's, like, she's like, no, <laughs> there's a way beyond this, right? So let's read together. Um, so I'm not even going to read, okay, let's see, um, I'm going to find it, yes, go to page 21, and we're, we're just, we're not, even, yeah, we're going to read one, two, three, fourth paragraph, but the subject, object dichotomy, are you there, put your hand on the screen, 21, fourth paragraph, okay, all right, so here she's uh, paraphrasing Merleau-Ponty, there's a lot of weird concepts, which I'll translate some of them, not all. 
um, but this is what she says. But the subject-object dichotomy also depends upon the manner in which sexuality itself is conceived. So subject-object dichotomy means the subject remains here, the object remains there, the self, the other, and there's a separation. And that's what Merleau-Ponty is saying. There's always going to be a separation. You can never really feel uh, you can never really get to the connection to the intimacy you want because we are essentially separate beings, right? Um, so she, she continues. Maurice Merleau-Ponty considers sexuality as ambiguity and indeterminacy, which are related not only to the body, but to life in general. Now here's her criticism, right? As a result, so she's talking about this kind of sexuality where you remain locked in your own sensations, where you can never really truly connect. You had a good time, but no connection, right? And she says, as a result, sexuality, so this way of having sex that he's describing, it does not favor the emergence of intersubjectivity. Okay, let's stop on that word intersubjectivity. What does it mean? Anybody know? Think of intercontinental. Right, we can't take any more. <laughs> What's intersubjectivity? How would you define it? What's inter mean? Like intercontinental. Uh, so inter, just define inter, Hakimian. Yes, thank you, Tamam. Between, between, very good. Right? So, She's saying the sexuality does not favor the emergence of a connection between subjects, right? She's saying basically it's not, it's not favoring the, the between, it's not favoring the, the relationship between them, the intimacy, right? And again, she's going to criticize that, right? She's going to say, well, you know, this is, a, again, short-sighted view that this is where we are and this is, there's nothing we can do about it, right? So this is intermediate, right? Because there is a desire to connect emotionally, but somehow it's not working. Many of us will get to that place in our relationships, right? As soon as you enter a committed relationship, you'll get to a point at one moment, right? Unless you have an amazing lover, <laughs> right? So this, is, this happens sometimes. Some people are gifted and they both meet each other, right? If two gifted people meet each other, you have a great marriage. <laughs> but most of us are not that gifted. So you'll get to a point where you'll be thinking, hmm, our sex is nice, it's fun, but it's not great, right? And it's, it doesn't feel like... I feel there could be more, right? We could be more connected, but we're not able, we connect great in different ways, but sexually we still, I still feel like the connection is not as good as it could be, right? So you, you a lot of us will hit that, that point. And that's why Irigura is urging us to get to the third level. Okay, Morissette, Morissette, go ahead. But Professor, don't you think that the way that society paint actually, paint sex, especially Western society, the way that we paint how sex should be and how sex should feel, it's actually a selling, it's like selling things that doesn't exist. It's like selling dreams to people not that, that can actually hurt their own relationship because people get into a sexual relationship with preset conditioned mind where they should see sparkles and colors, rainbows, unicorns flying as soon as they start kissing. But things like that just, it just doesn't happen. And, and then people actually have those condition mind that they have set. And when they don't get it, this is when people will be like, okay, so I should actually look for the next person that would give me those sparkles without actually trying to see within them how they can manage, how they can find out, how they can bring some sparkles, but the sparkles that, that are described in books and, and, and movies, they don't exist. Right. Okay. So, right. yeah, it's very sad the HBO came into our lives <laughs> because now uh, we are, like you said, conditioned to think that, uh, first of all, we are conditioned to think that sex in an elevator is great which it's not, <laughs> right? Um, we're conditioned to think that fast-paced sex or sex with a stranger or, you know, like um, 
meeting someone randomly, right, is even possible, right? So this is this this is this works for males, doesn't work for females, right? The type of HBO sex, I think, is the scripts are written by males <laughs> because no woman is going to be comfortable in any of these positions, <laughs> right, that they're depicted in. So you're right. We have not only is the um, is there a kind of fantasy um, that is cultivated, but also a lot of these movies, the sex is, the movies are written by men. And so the sex is their fantasies, which when it comes to us, is not happening, <laughs> right? And we're gonna talk today with Iri Garay of what a woman really needs, what a woman really wants. And it doesn't fit any of these movies, right? That, that we see. So yes, that's one of the issues. Um, one thing that I, I have quoted, um, to people who are saying, ah, oh, you know, I don't feel like this huge spark, you know, with this person, but, you know, there's love, but not this, you know, like you were saying, the fireworks aren't there. Um, there is an African proverb um, speaking to the Western uh, way of, of having sex, and they say, for you, okay, let me not mess this up. Um, yes. Uh, the beginning is very hot and eventually gets cold, right? But for us, in the beginning is cold and little by little it warms up and it becomes hot, right? So there's a, two different ways, right? The Western in the movies is hot sex right away and then it cools down and we break up. <laughs> but the African way, that, at least according to that proverb that I heard um, from a friend of mine, it starts out pretty cool chill, not in a good way, cold, <laughs> right? Cold because you don't know each other, you haven't lived anything together, you haven't experienced anything together, you don't know each other, barely, and as you grow with that person, things warm up, right? But in a slow, gradual way. So we need that counter narrative, I believe. We need this African proverb to remind ourselves that there are other ways to do this, right? Um, so thank you, uh, Morissette. Um, does that help a little bit, my response? Uh, do you want to add anything? Yes, yes, it does. And I think that's, that's one of the points that I got from, from her, her book is like the way that you have to get custom to your partner, to your lover, technically. But that's exactly what we, as people, we don't teach ourselves and even our children or people in our family. They don't teach us as well. Because if you're going to learn to appreciate something by knowing it, but we are taught to just having the sparkle in the beginning, if we don't have the sparkle, we don't actually take time to know that thing. We just leave and go, go on our like, cult for the, for, the, for the sparkles that we don't get the first time. So Excellent. I would apply Rumi's proverb, the ocean in the water jar, to sexuality also, right? We tend to forget that every human being is a treasure that needs to be opened but most of us we don't know how to open each other right and so we're left with this chest or trunk right and we're low circling uh and and there is really we need to be taught how do we open and release right the the ocean in 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 our partners and part of what she's doing in the text that we're about to study um, she's going to talk about how, more specifically for a woman, right? How do you open a woman? How do you release her ocean, right? Because too many times you are with that woman and you get bored. Why? Because you haven't released her, <laughs> right? So, or it was great in the beginning and now it sucks. Why? Because you still haven't found the key, right? You're circling. So that's really why um, this section that we're about to study is so important. And it does focus on the woman, right? Since she's writing... Um, She's the female voice, right? So it does focus on a woman. So what we're about to learn is going to be useful to both men and women, right? For women, it will show us where is our treasure? Where is our ocean? How can we teach the man we're with to release it, right? Um, because often men don't know they, unless they, they've learned, right? But very often they don't know how to open us really, right? So we have to learn how to do it so we can teach them. For the men in the classroom, this is great. You're, you're, in, the, you're in the first lodge, right? To really enter the woman's psyche to understand what a woman needs sexually, right? So all of us are going to benefit today, right? From this lesson, from living us, okay. So let's get there. Let's see what, so this is the third one, advanced sex. This is Levinas. And just to review, Merleau-Ponty, I, 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 it, I, you, what do you think? 
<laughs> the one before, Merleau Ponty, what do you think? I, 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 it, or I, you? You can put it in the chat if you don't want to talk. When you're all by yourself, Merleau Ponty is I, you, low? Okay, Pistone, thank you. <laughs> Right, Melo Ponti? Yes, it is a little closer because you're trying to reach the other, but you're still stuck in yourself, right? So you're, and you're just not able to connect. This is the I, I, okay? So Melo Ponti, make sure you write this down. This is I, I. This is just for us. Um, she doesn't talk about I, you, I, I, but it's for us to remember. Okay, let's get to the last level, which is Levinas, which will be the I, you relationship in lovemaking. Okay. So she's going to start, so again, I'll summarize, right? She's going to start with Levinas with a passage that he wrote, right? She's going to quote him at length, and then she's going to interpret, right? So, uh, so let's read a little bit together and see if you can figure out what Levinas is talking about. Okay, so I'm on page 24, third paragraph, the caress. Wave at me if you're there. Okay. All right, so here, this is a quote from Levinas, right? This is not a regret, this is Levinas. But then she'll develop it, she'll comment on it. All right, so as I'm reading, try to think about what he's describing. He's also very poetic, very mysterious. So he says this, the caress consists in seizing upon nothing and soliciting what ceaselessly escapes its form toward a future, never future enough, and soliciting what slips away as though it were not yet I, and I wish to add, this is man's caress, I, it searches, it forages, it is not an intentionality of disclosure, but of search. Okay, what is he talking about? What kind of, he's talking about a way of touching, right, which is sexual, but what is he describing exactly? What part of the encounter is he describing? Um, there is a word in the American language that describes this. Starts with an F, and it's not the word you're thinking about. Yes. Yes, foreplay, excellent. Exactly. Right. Levinas is talking at length. And this is only a small section. He actually has a whole chapter where he describes the art of foreplay. All the ways, you know, you can kiss and touch a woman and caress her and and all of the feelings that are aroused with this way of touching and so forth. And so he goes on and on for a whole chapter in his book, uh, Totality and Infinity, right? So why does he spend such a long time on this, right? And, and why is he rigorized so excited <laughs> to see this man describing this um, way of touching for so long, uh, for such a long time, right? So the main reason, right, why Rigori is um, quoting this at length is that for her, foreplay is the most important part in the woman's experience as she's having a sexual encounter. It's the most, and there are many reasons for that, right? So most of the men, they come in the encounter thinking, I have to give her an orgasm. You're, you're, it's, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I think it's great for men to think, let me worry about her orgasm too, right? So many men come in with really good intentions, right? They, they want to give you an orgasm. But what they don't understand is that for you to have an orgasm, you need to have this whole foreplay to be very well done, <laughs> right? And so really what Irigaray is saying is that this is not as important as this element of foreplay for a woman's experience. So I'm gonna explain why it is so important uh, for the man to take the time to be with a woman in a kind of sensual way rather than just sexual, right? Or before getting to the main course, this is so needed, right? So in other words, what, what Irigaray is describing is what a lot of treatises of, of sex are describing also in um, ancient treatises, right? They go on and on about this foreplay business, right? In fact, uh, there are some treatises, I'll, I'm gonna quote a few that you know, you know, of course, the Kuk, um, Kama Sutra, right? But this is not the best one. There's the, in the Muslim tradition, there's the perfume garden, which is amazing. And then there's uh, a couple more, right? And I forgot the name of the third one, right? But you have in the Indian tradition, in the Muslim tradition, actually in, in the biblical, in the Hebraic tradition, in the Talmud, you have many passages also about foreplay, uh, how to be with a woman on the first encounter, right? So many, many, many treatises on sexuality, which are written for men, by the way, they emphasize page after page. If you read the Kama Sutra, there's a, a couple pages on the positions, but thousands of, well, thousands, 
tens and twenties of pages, right? Focused on how to kiss, how to touch, how to caress, how to embrace and so forth. So this is the part that they skip in, in when they make the Barnes and Noble, Noble's edition of the Kama Sutra. They skip this important part. Perfume garden is all about that too, right? So, so medieval treatises, ancient treatises on sexuality written for men understood, right, the, the, the high importance of this learning to touch a woman before actually getting to the main course. And now you realize seeing, right, Levinas doing the same thing. So why is it so important? What happens when you skip that or when you don't really refine that, right, when you're not so good at it? So there's two reasons. I'm going to talk about two reasons. The first one is ethical and the second one is hedonistic or <laughs> the argument from pleasure has to do with pleasure. Okay, so let me start with the ethical part of it. Okay, so for Irina Rai, what she's describing is that if you're a man and you, and you skip that, right, if you move too fast, there are high chances, and you can actually do that even when you love her deeply, right? Many men don't take the time because not in their nature, right? The man is a pretty fast being, right? So it's not necessarily in their nature to take their time. So they don't mean anything wrong with it, but the woman actually ends up feeling used, right? If you go too fast, no matter how much you have told her you love her and you put a ring on her finger, everything you've done, right? If you move too fast, physiologically or emotionally, even without wanting to, she's going to feel used and um, there will be some sadness in her, something frustrated. <laughs> Frustrated, I think, would be the right word, right? I mean, she won't tell you, of course, right? But there's, there's, so for, for, so the, the, this is the ethical dimension of it, right? The difference, if you skip the foreplay, you, 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 the foreplay is the difference for the woman, right? Between feeling like an it and feeling like a you. Okay, let me say that again, right? The foreplay, the time you take, right, to express your love through caresses, kisses, words, embraces the time you take is the difference for the woman between feeling like an it and feeling like a you right so the foreplay is really a way for you to express to her you're in, you're you to me you're not just an it that's the language right that she will understand once you do it she will then understand okay i'm a you i'm not an it and then it will be easier for her to open up right um, which brings me to the second point which is the element of pleasure right so it depends on the woman here, right? Some women, they get aroused very quickly. They can do it by themselves. They can just look at the man and it's done, right? But many women actually need a lot of time, right? And they need to be warmed up. Uh, and, and not only physically, but emotionally. The foreplay, what we need to understand is that it's not just preparing the woman physically, it's preparing her emotionally. Because only when she's ready emotionally will she be ready physically, right? So the foreplay is really you uh, as a man, right? Warming her up so that she can properly open up to you both emotionally and physically, right? If you move too fast, chances are she won't be ready, right? And some women actually at that moment might experience pain, right? Through intercourse. So if, if you're one of those women or if you know someone who's, who's like that, right? Or if you have a partner as a man who, who is experiencing pain through intercourse, chances are it's not that you're incompatible, right? There is no, actually, I believe personally, there is no physical incompatibility. It's a, the woman can push a baby out of her. <laughs> That's huge, right? So there's no reason, right, that she cannot receive uh, from any type of man, right? So there is no, I don't believe in physical incompatibility. What I believe is the man has not learned how to open up that woman. He has not uh, learned the ritual or the time or the foreplay that she needs right and it depends on the woman right in order for her to feel comfortable opening up many women also it's not even the man's fault it could be some trauma from before right she could have been living in a violent context or she could have been um you know traumatized by something that happened to her or that she witnessed right now she's in incapable of opening so it might not even be you as a man right but just know the woman simply needs 
this kind of healing, right? The foreplay for the woman is a healing balm on many of the things that keep her closed up, right? So, so the foreplay is really, for me, it's like, it's a love potion, <laughs> right? That the woman needs to drink before she can be fully um, uh, present to you as a man, right? If you want to really melt that woman, <laughs> right? That's what you do, right? In, in the perfumed garden, which is the Muslim text, um, it talks about the woman being like the basil leaf. Uh, let me write this down. <laughs> uh, anybody ever tried a basil leaf? Anybody uses basil in their cooking? Put your hand up. Okay. Uh, what do you have to do to the leaf before it actually tastes or uh, smells? What do you have to do to it? Can you just like put it like that or what do you have to do with the leaf? <laughs> See who's a cook in here. <laughs> Do you just put the whole leaf? I guess you do. Yeah, you do uh, Italian style. <laughs> so what, what the, the perfume garden is saying is the leaf actually doesn't reveal its scent unless you crush it. And it's true, right? Yes, you have to shake it a little bit. Thank you, Ziga. Have another cook in the house. Okay, <laughs> very good. Right? You have to crush it a little bit and then it releases itself. It's the same thing for a woman, right? If you want her to release everything to you, if you want her to surrender to you, you have to crush her a little bit, <laughs> right? And that's why you have, this is such a tragedy, right? Because you have gorgeous women who are with these men who don't know how to crush. And so they're circling these women, feeling like there's never any connection, like the sex is not as hot as it could be as it is with this other, you know. So what, the, what men often don't realize, the basal leaf will not release itself unless you <laughs> learn to crush it a little bit, right? So every woman is a basal leaf, right? Um, and women, take this information and teach it to your men, right? I know we have only five men in the class, <laughs> so, and 20 women. So learn this, right? The, the, and teach it to your partners. I'm a basil leaf. Show him, <laughs> right? Cook a salad, make a salad with a basil leaf so he understands, right? So this is the first thing, right? In order for the woman to fully release everything that she is, or like I say, to release her nectar, right? She needs that ritual right, which is this foreplay, this expression of love, and then you will have really, um, and, and by the way, if it, it's, it's bad to skip it for the woman, but it's also bad to skip it for the man, because if the woman has not been prepared, if she has not, if she's not releasing, surrendering, then the sex will feel like something is missing, and many men come to me, and they say, you know, I feel like something is missing with my girlfriend, right, there's something off i don't know what it is like we're bored it's always the same thing but have you really opened her up right it's very tragic the way that even in many long lasting marriages the woman has never been truly opened up she remains a kind of virgin right even though you have made love to her she, you have never found a way to open her up until you learn that language right the foreplay is the code is the key to opening up the woman. And learning that is crucial, right? As a man, learn that language because this is the language that will release the woman, that will open her up truly to you, that will cause her to surrender, right? Okay, now here's a few of the comments of Yuri right, to add to everything I've said. Um, okay, so first of all, page 25, go to, um, yeah. Go to the one, two, third paragraph, which is just one line. The caress is an awakening. Are you there? Hand in the screen. Okay. Very short line. The caress is an awakening to you, to me, to us. Remember what I told you about sexuality being a way to release the other, to help them find themselves? When you caress someone, especially for the woman, I don't know for the man so much, right? I'm not a man. But for the woman, as you learn to caress her, what are you doing? You are awakening her to herself, right? She doesn't even know she had all this, right? So in many ways, as a man, as you explore her, you are not only discovering her, she is discovering herself through your touch, right? The man, in a way, through the caresses, you are shaping the woman into, you're shaping that, the, 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 um, your girlfriend or your wife into the woman that she never even thought she was, right? So it is almost an act of creation, right? As you learn to touch her, you are shaping her into the woman that she can only become through you, right? So there's something about knowing how to make love to a woman like that, which awakens her to herself, 
right? And as she awakens to herself, you are awakening to yourself as a man too, and the the us is being formed, right? So this is also very interesting. Then you have in the next page, uh, page 26, um, second paragraph, the caress is a gesture word. Are you there? Put your hand on the screen. Okay. So this one I'm going to stop a little bit on because it's so important. Uh, the caress is a gesture word. So this is a kind of strange word that she invented. Okay, so gesture word. So first of all, what does a gesture mean? What's the meaning of the word gesture? Come on, tell me what's a gesture? Like a gift? Like a what? Is it like I'm giving, that's my gesture to you, like it's a gift? Uh, yes, to a certain degree, but more, more uh, literally, Hakimian is right, it's an action, it's uh, something you do. But yes, it's a gift, but it's something you do. What's a word? What are words for? Why, why do we speak? <laughs> Why do we use words? Let's think about that for a second. Okay, very good. To be understood, to yes. express. Exactly, right? Everybody's saying it. Communicate, express. Okay, so a gesture word, therefore, is, is a way to touch which expresses something. Okay, let me say that again. So let me write it in the chat. A gesture word is a touch which expresses how you feel, right? In other words, what she's saying here, which is so fundamental, which we're forgetting, I think, more and more, is that sex is a way to express love. It's not a way to have fun. It's not a way to just, you know, hang out. It's a way to express love. It's a language. It's an embodied language which speaks love to the other. And if you don't have love inside of you, don't speak. <laughs> because what are you going to say? Right. So this is I want you to remember this because so, this is something we forget so much in our civilization. We treat sex like um, eating and drinking and exercising. <laughs> right. I have need. I have to feed myself. I have too much energy. I have to exercise. Right. We see sex as a way to simply fulfill a need or get rid of excess energy. Right. We see it as part of the things we need to do to survive as a human being. She's saying no. No. <laughs> if you have excess energy, exercise. If you're hungry, eat. S sexuality is not just there to help you feed a need. Sexuality is a language by which you express what you deeply feel. And so if you don't have deep feelings, then why are you talking, <laughs> right? Don't say something with your hands and with your mouth and with your body that you don't mean right that's what she's saying we are forgetting that sexuality is a way to communicate love and it, it to go further right because she's talking about the caress right foreplay for a woman is the only language she understands if you want to express love right if as a man you want to show the woman you love her it's not the orgasm right it's not the ring it's the foreplay how are you how much are you able to express your love through your touch, right? And that is what she understands. Now, again, right, this is not natural to a man. The man expresses love differently. And so in a way, he almost has to learn this foreign language, right, in order to make her feel or understand the love he feels for her, right? So, so that's the first thing we get here, right, with this gesture word business. Now, there's something else. What we're learning here also is that the, the, lovemaking actually necessitates a certain level of emotional maturity if you're not emotionally mature you can't make love you cannot you can have sex but you can't make love right so this whole uh, the elevator scene right on the movies in the movies when you see people just met at a party and they're just tearing off their clothes <laughs> right and they're having this encounter really super brief in the elevator and it's like super hot right no <laughs> maybe for the man it's great right for the woman probably hurts <laughs> right so um and and you know she might go home and cry after the elevator encounter if we don't show that right so this is what uh, she's saying is that lovemaking actually necessitates on the part of both partners a certain level of emotional maturity. If you want to really have amazing sex or, you know, good sex or intimate sex, rather, let's use that word, right? Intimate sex, you need to have something to say, right? Um, by the way, do you remember in the Song of Songs, we didn't do this passage, but it's a very powerful passage, actually. Um, Let's see if you remember a little bit. Remember when he, when the guy goes into her garden to eat his fruits? Do you remember that passage? Okay. 
Now, what, we didn't study this, but right before he goes into the garden, where I didn't say this, but this is where, you know, commentators say this is where they're having sex the whole first time, right? For, for real, before they're just messing around, right? But in the garden, this is symbolic, right? When you say, go into my garden, you're talking about sex, right? So he goes there, but before that, he calls her something. He has a name for her, which he says seven times before he gets into the garden. Does anybody remember? the name he gives her seven times before entering her garden. Anybody remember? <laughs> you can put it in the chat if you don't want to talk. Um, no, not friend. That's not enough, friend. <laughs> you can open your garden if the guy calls you a friend. <laughs> you disappoint me. <laughs> What, do you, what does he call her that really causes her to really open up in that way? Uh, there's something as a key word. All of us want to hear that word, actually, to be honest. Well, maybe not all, but a lot of us. <laughs> so he does call her my sister, my friend. It's not that. <laughs> okay. Almost. He never, yes, my, it's not just my beloved. It's something else, but close. Starts with a B. <laughs> BR. Yes, Ziegel, very good. Bride. Okay, he called, they never really officially marry in the text, right? We saw that. But he calls her my sister, my bride, my sister, my bride, my seven times. And then she opens up, right? So this is just an illustration from that ancient text, right? The emotional maturity that the man had to develop before they could be together in that way, right? And this is really so important to postpone sex until you have that emotional maturity. Although in the Song of Songs, they don't postpone anything, right? They gain the emotional maturity by having sex, <laughs> right? Um, but in any case, whether you postpone or whether you throw yourself in it, what will make the sex hot in the African sense, right, is the emotional maturity that is developed in the relationship. This is what will enhance, right, the, the lovemaking. So, the, and by the way, this is the reason, by the way, the fact that re sex needs emotional maturity to really be fulfilling, right? This is what explains why this notion of uh, testing the compatibility before committing, right, uh, is, is a myth, right? Let me talk a little bit about that. Um, but before that, we have a question from Hakim Yan. Why does he call her his bride? What's, I don't know. I, I didn't write the text. What do you mean, Hakim Yan? <laughs> like, they're not married, and like, how does that Im improve the emotional maturity of the relationship? Like, what does that do? I don't get it. I mean, like I said, right, in the text, they acquire emotional maturity as they um, spend time together, right? As, as the relationship grows, they acquire, as we saw, right? She changes, he changes, they become more committed, right? So at that point, you're right. At that point of the text, they're still very immature, but he's at least setting the intention, <laughs> put it like that, right? But in the text, to be honest, at least in the way I read it, right? They acquire emotional maturity only at the end, right? And that's when really the love has grown, right? But, but this is just in the text, as I was reading it, it surprised me that there were seven times this name and then she opens the garden as though she was needing to hear them, right, seven times. Uh, Morissette, yes. Isn't it like the acknowledgement of it? It's like, I, I don't know how to say that. Like, for example, you can be in a, I would not say in a relationship, like if you are, if you single, you, you're just seeing someone. So technically when you say I'm seeing someone, but then for the relation to get to another level, sometimes, especially the men have to acknowledge, like this is, for example, if you go out with that person and he, he met his other friend. And then you're like, oh, this is, and then the way he introduced you, like, oh, this is my friend. At the moment, you're like, oh, oh right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but if you say, oh, this is my girlfriend, at that moment, you oh. felt like you acknowledge the fact that he can hold your hand or, you know, be close to you. I'm just saying, yeah. like, it's just the acknowledgement. 
Yeah, the word, right? Remember, in the Hebrew context, the words create reality, right? Words are powerful. So if he calls her that, then there is something real, right, about um, that word or the, the way he names her that, right? Um, so yeah, um, so that this is one of the rare or subtle allusions to marriage in the Song of Songs, right? It's an ambiguous text. You have this kind of free love, but you do have several allusions to marriage, several. You have that and you have also her, I never told you this, but she actually uh, proposes to him in the end. This is a good one, right? He never proposes. She's the one who actually does the marriage proposal towards the end. You can read it again and try and find it. Okay, so going back to this issue of this, this uh, myth that I've heard a lot, right, in uh, circulating among students that, well, before I commit to this woman or before I commit to this man, I'm going to sleep with them so I can see if we're compatible, right? Now, based on everything we learned, we see how this is not going to work. Why? <laughs> because you can't know how the person will be sexually until you commit, at least as far as the woman is concerned, right? Because the woman opens up, only truly opens up when emotional, emotionally she feels loved, right? This is when the woman really blossoms. Um, because of that, trying her out or test driving her, right? Before you are willing to commit as a man, you will only get a stunted, limited version of who she could be in bed, right? So you can't really test drive. <laughs> A woman or a man for that matter, right? Because the the bloss the sexual blossoming cannot happen unless there is love. You can have sex, right? But the blossoming, right? Any woman, any man can have sex without having any feelings, and it can be not bad at all, right? But if you want the if you want to see the person in their full blossoming sexually, you can't until you have really committed. And so you can't really tell if you're compatible before committing, right? You have to actually commit. And then it's not even a question. I really tend to believe, I, again, I'm gonna emphasize this. I don't believe that anyone who is emotionally compatible is going to be sexually incompatible, right? Um, if you have chemistry, if you have you know, emotional or physical chemistry, it's enough, you know, right? And if there are problems sexually, it's simply things that need to be healed, right? It's not that you're incompatible. I continue to maintain this, right? That if you love someone and you have chemistry and you then have sex with them and the sex is not the same as what you expected, this is not a sign that you are incompatible. It's simply a sign that there are things that need to be healed, communicated, uh, or fixed in the relationship, right? So, I, so this idea of... of um, testing the compatibility, first of all, is impossible, and second of all, is unnecessary in my view, right? So let me say it again. So this, this the whole myth that you have to test, you know, try them out <laughs> before you fully commit. Number one, it doesn't work because the person will not be able to really reveal who they are as a sexual being until they're loved or until they feel loved. And number two, it's unnecessary. If you have chemistry, it's good. You're good to go. Whatever is going to go wrong are things you simply need to heal, address, resolve emotionally. Uh, remember, we talked about in Buber that sometimes when the sex grows bland, it's not the sex. It's the emotional component of the relationship that has gone bad. The person has shifted from you to it, right? So a lot of these sexual issues that we focus so much on in our culture would be really easily resolved by looking at the emotional components, right? So that's one of the myths I wanted to clear up um, <laughs> once and for all. Um, because to be honest, compatibility is really something that you create. It's not something that you have, right? I mean, you do. I do believe you need the chemistry. You need to have some kind of attraction, right? If you're completely repulsed, I mean, don't do it, <laughs> right? But if you sense an attraction or even a curiosity, this is a good sign. The compatibility is something that you create together in time through the experiences. It's like the African proverb, right? The hotness comes at the end, not at the beginning. Uh, Maurice said. <clears throat> I, I understand what you said, but what about two people? like? Sometimes they, two people will tell you, oh, I just, they hate each other, but they still have physical attraction. 
Like, yeah. <clears throat> some people have amazing chemistry. I mean, <laughs> so some people, it's true. Some people are able to have amazing sex when they hate each other. And I really admire that. <laughs> but not everyone is like that, right? Um, it depends on the risk. Many people, once the, um, there is uh, emotional problems, the chemistry suffers, right? So, but yeah, you do have people like that. I agree. <laughs> the, they're so uh, gifted, are they, right? Who can do that? And it's true, it exists. Um, but a lot of people, right? It, it will happen that it, the emotional connection causes a block sexually. Yeah, so, but yeah, Morissette, you're right. There are people like that, I agree. <laughs> yes, does that answer your question, uh, Morissette? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Not that I answered it, but <laughs> I just agreed with you. Okay, very good. Um, okay, any questions on anything I said? This is your big moment to ask any question on sex that has been bothering you. <laughs> this is our only class, right? This is the opportunity. Or anything that we mentioned that you are uh, iffy about or doubtful or uh, I want to hear it. And remember, your questions help me to make my lectures better for the next class. So <laughs> don't hesitate. Any questions on any of this? All right, very good. Um, okay, so do you guys wanna just continue with the rest? Um, Cause I don't wanna take too long for the rest, maybe like 10, 15 minutes. Let, put your hand in the screen if you want me to just continue. How many need a break? Uh, to be okay, we'll have a break. All right, so, <laughs> yeah, I respect, I respect. So it's 5.35, let's meet again in 5.38 uh, for um, the rest of the um, Irigurai. Okay, so last part of Irigurai. Actually for this, I'm gonna wanna be a little more interactive, kind of like we did for Boober, because she's again being very poetic in that chapter, right? This is the chapter on silence, on 62 to, yeah, 62 to 67, so we can turn there. And I want us just to kind of um, brainstorm what she means, right? By this notion of silence in the couple, right? So I want us to start to think about it together. I'm gonna read the, the quote I want us to talk about, and then we'll just focus on that quote and try to see what she means uh, together. So here's the quote, um, yeah. I'm gonna start at the top of the page, which is many words have been spoken. Or if you can just put your hand if you're there, top of page 62, okay. So she says this, right? Many words have been spoken about I love to you, which I would love to get into because in the French, it's very interesting the way it works. But without a blackboard, it's a little hard. <laughs> so I'll skip that for now. <laughs> So she continues, I find myself wondering if the work of love that the book transmits, so that other book, right, has conveyed the fact that to love each other between us, now here we go, woman and man, women and men, requires the protection of a space, a place of silence. So I want us to meditate on this. What does she mean when she says that between the man and the woman or between you and your partner, right, uh, whatever your orientation is, there has to be a space, a desert. And then she calls this space a place of silence, right? So, and then she uh, goes just a little bit further, and then I'll, I'll get you more set. So the one, two, third paragraph, but not simply shared, she says, I must protect the silence in me. So not only between us, but in me, I must respect the silence of the other. And then she concludes, thus silence is two. Okay, so this is the passage I want us to talk about. And I'm, I'm opening it up now to everyone. What does it mean, the space of silence? What is the silence in me? What is the silence in them? Why is silence too? All right, I'm listening. Let's start with Morissette, and then we'll have Hakimian. Go ahead. I just wanted to say, because when I started reading that, I remember when you said, I because I said something about Rumi, when I said about um, the last passage, when he said that, you can you can still have a secret and then i was tell i was saying that i, I love that part and mm -hmm. you said if you love that part you're gonna love <laughs> you're gonna love this because and this is what i saw immediately when i started reading it and that's my interpretation of it it's like not because we are in a relationship mean that we are not allowed to still be the person that we are like we still entitled to our secret 
we still entitled to our silence. Like if I don't want to say something, if I don't want it's you to know about something, I'm still entitled to keep it. And that doesn't mean that we are breaking apart. It just means that we are reinforcing who we are. And by reinforcing we, who we are, we are stronger as a person and we're stronger in a relationship. Right. And I, I really, I, I like that. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, in other words, we don't have to share everything. <laughs> we don't have to share every activity, every thought, every, you know, there can, you can have your secret garden, right? Very good. Hakim Yan, um, you're next. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I agree with you guys. Um, so I thought that silence didn't mean that you guys shouldn't talk or shouldn't communicate or, or that you should keep everything to yourself. Um, but I think it's like you have to pick and choose like certain things that you keep for yourself. And it, not only should you keep it for yourself, but I think that um, the fact that you're not sharing every single part of you like almost creates like an air of mystery and an air of like attraction. Like when you first meet someone, like you're so attracted to them. Um, and part of that is because like there's a mystery and because you don't know them and you're curious. So like when you leave space for them, like, like it maintains that like curiosity and that like mystery that what was what attracted you to them in the first place okay very good remember the art of seduction in the song of songs right where the woman where they learn to give but not everything <laughs> right give a little bit at a time this is what you're saying Hakimia, right for the sake of mystery for the sake of seduction you want to keep a little bit right have part of yourself remain uh, apart right uh yes very good dali please tell us more <laughs> speak to us <laughs> So, like, a lot of times, you know, throughout the course of, like, the, the lectures, it's come up more than once, just the idea that sometimes you can get very possessive when you get with somebody, and you can almost want to make them more similar to you, if not, like, almost, you know, like, you're, like, another you that exists in the world. So, like, with the silence, and then especially with, like, the separated, like, spheres of silence, you know, it's a way to just make sure that you can just continue to, like, be, and, like, just when I say just be like, just be yourself, you know, be the person that you met and fell in love with and not necessarily become transformed into like this different person that you might, you know, like be, um, what's the word that you might be like unknowingly changing them to become. Yes. Very good. Actually, you touch, you touch upon a concept that Erika Ryan mentions a lot in other texts, which is the concept of letting be. You actually said that right. Kind of in your, um, in your uh, in the chat she talks about letting be right letting the other grow at their own pace grow in the direction that they feel they should grow instead of controlling right so silence is also a way to <laughs> like the the little uh, smiley face in the phone right that goes like this right it's a way to also shut up <laughs> when you want to correct the other right when you want to give them a device or when you want to you know uh change them right so silence is a way to i'm not gonna say anything i'm gonna let you be right that's another way to see it excellent you guys are doing great let's hear a couple more comments that's uh you're doing better than me <laughs> a couple more comments that this passage inspires you um okay tamam speak to us <laughs> tell us um i thought it was privacy in the sense that like there's space in your relationship that's like that no one else knows about and it's just between the two of you but then you also have your own personal space which is just between you and yourself and like the other person has a space that's just between them and themselves so like there's space that's just for the two of you and then there's space for each person yeah. in which that they don't have to share with anyone else very nice very nice absolutely every human being has their own inner authority or their own divinity right that you have to respect their process right their space um if you want the relationship to last and very often we intrude in each other's spaces right we intrude with our criticism we intrude with our complaining we intrude with the fact that they should change we want to control but to respect those spaces is actually to save the relationship. That's also what Buber said when he talks about preserving the vow, right? Aguirre, go ahead, speak to us. Like, 
I think that, for example, sometimes we are telling them an advice or we just kind of criticize them about something because we care about them and we want them to grow up uh, social or just personally. We want them to grow up and we are saying something that is not like correct or is not right. We have to tell them or let them know that it's what they are doing is not the right thing and they, they have to correct that. I mean, they don't have to, but they have to at least try to listen to us and then have to let them know about that. So, so be is careful. it just, just be short careful. up or just like <laughs> let them be and try to get like let them because be and just make the mistakes? Yes, Aguirre, be careful because there are two ways of loving. And many often we fall into the first way. There's the mother's love and there is the spouse love, right? Mother tells the child what to do. Grow up. Here's what you need to do to grow up. Not the spouse, <laughs> right? If you start to do this as the girlfriend or the wife or the spouse, you're going to fall into mother category. And mother category is not a good place to be, especially if you want to have hot sex. <laughs> You see what I mean, Aguirre? So you have to be very, and it's instinctual. I mean, I am, I am laughing because I'm like that, right? It's instinctual in a woman. We are nurturing and we see very clearly what is wrong, right? And so we fall often into the temptation to be the mother of the, of the guy by telling him what to do, how to grow up, how to change. What Irigura is saying, if you want to be the spouse, <laughs> Silence. Um, so it doesn't mean you never say anything, but it means you respect the man enough to wait for him to solicit your advice. I mean, you can say things, but you have to be careful that you don't sound like his mother, I guess. That's what I'm saying. Does that make sense, Aguirre? <laughs> yeah, it does. But how can you like don't sound like a mother if you're like, trying to give him a piece of advice at the same time? So I think the best way is to follow Kierkegaard, right? Kierkegaard says, focus on the good, and then that will grow. The mother, she's going to say, let's, let's suppose your husband is, smokes a lot, too much. It's okay, smoke a little bit, smoking all the time, in the house with the baby. <clears throat> okay, he has to stop in your mind. He has to stop for the baby, <laughs> right? Mother says, stop smoking. I order you to stop smoking. You need to stop, right? To the child, she would say that. You can't be the mother, so how are you going to do it? So Kierkegaard was saying, you can talk, but you can say, you know, I love it when you smoke outside. It, it feels so much better. Uh, I, uh, and that's it. You focus on the times, the effort he has made at times to smoke outside. You say, wow, thank you. Thank you for smoking outside. I appreciate the way that you uh, protect our baby <laughs> by smoking outside, right? So Kierkegaard is telling you, if you want to be a spouse, you got to be more subtle. Otherwise, you fall into the mother category and then the sex is gone. <laughs> Believe me, right? Unless you're one of those hot couples that Morissette mentioned that nothing will stop them, right? Um, does that make sense, Aguirre? Yeah, it does. Like, yeah, it does kind of make sense. Like, <laughs> I mean, you are giving him an advice and at the same time, you are kind of worrying about them, but at the same time, you're not being like his mother. And don't like being like, okay, do this and do that. And just, exactly. you're just kind of allowing him to do the things, but not kind of pushing him to do it. Exactly, right? And, and focusing on what he's doing right, that's the Kierkegaard, that's the technique Kierkegaard does. He says, when you focus on what the person is doing right, it's more powerful than focusing on what he's doing wrong. If you want him to grow into an amazing partner, you focus on what he's already doing right and you just feed that, you water that. As soon as you focus on the rest, it grows, <laughs> right? So that's the idea. Um, Lo, you had a, 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 a comment, I think. Yeah, it was basically very similar to what everyone was saying, but I think that sometimes silence speaks louder than words and not every situation needs an answer. Not like in the sense of like critiquing like someone and saying that they could better themselves with this, but like if someone's talking to you and like expressing how they're feeling, like sometimes you don't, you don't need to like tell them what to do. You don't need a solution. Sometimes just being there speaks a lot louder. Excellent. Irigar also talks about that a little later in the text about attentiveness, right? The ability to just receive and be there and witness 
without solving and fixing and controlling, right? This is an act of love, actually, a much deeper act of love than trying to fix, because you're trying to fix ultimately for yourself, <laughs> right? But just listening and holding, right, the space for the person to express or vent or whatever is itself a very deep act of love. And that's very nicely put, Lo. Anything else? <laughs> that inspires you in this passage that we just read. Okay. All right. So we conclude then with the Rigurai. Let me uh, stop the recording.